All right, now we got it. So we're continuing in our study about repentance and looking at Psalm 51. Last week we t looked at uh, teaching transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted. This week we're going to back up just one verse to verse 12. But just for context, let's start with uh, Psalm 51 and verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. So we're going to put our attention tonight on verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing or a free spirit. So <clears throat> the word that's translated joy means gladness, joy, and mirth. And it only appears in the Old Testament 22 times. That was uh, a surprise to me. I would have figured there was more joy than 22 times in the Old Testament. And this word joy comes from the root word that means to be bright, cheerful, glad or rejoice and Deuteronomy 28:63 sort of is the defining verse in my mind about this root word for joy and it actually fits in what we're, with what we're going to look at in just a second There is a word that I I had not heard of before, and, and the word is self attestation. Attestation <laughs> comes from the word to attest. Nowadays, it's a legal term that's used to describe a photocopy of an original. You take the photocopy and you compare it to the original, and if they're exactly the same, then you're able to stamp it on the bottom, self-attestation, and it functions, in, it functions as the original in a legal pr proceeding. It, this word comes from an old theological term that's used to speak about God that God is self-attestation. In other words, you take what you believe about God and you compare it with what the Bible says about God. And if they're different, then you have a problem. But if they're the same, you're still, you're okay. You understand what I'm saying? So that this is extremely relevant because if we take some of these hard verses from the Bible and we present them as the word of God to people, they will tell you, maybe your God's like that, but mine's not. And God, God, is, God has self-attestation. In other words, it's God who gets to decide what he's like, not us. And so this verse, Deuteronomy 28, 63, is speaking about joy, gladness, mirth, the root word. But it also speaks about God. <coughs> so Deuteronomy 28, 63. 
this is uh, Moses warning the people. And in verse, uh, starting in verse 58, then we'll come down to 63 to get a little bit of the context. Moses warns the people. If you're not careful to observe all the words of this law, which are written in this book, to fear this honored and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring extraordinary pr plagues on you and your descendants, <clears throat> even severe and lasting plagues and miserable and chronic sicknesses. He will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt of which you were afraid, and they will cling to you. Also, every sickness and every plague which not written in the book of this law, the Lord will bring on you until you are destroyed. Then you shall be left few in numbers, whereas you were as numerous as the stars of the heaven, because you did not obey the Lord. Verse 63, this is our word delight. It shall come about that as the Lord delighted over you to prosper you <coughs> and to multiply you, so the Lord will delight over you to make you perish and destroy you, and you will be torn from the land where you are entering to possess it. God delighting over his people to prosper them, but then when they sin and don't turn back to God, God delights over them to make them perish. <coughs> so it's the same delight. Exact same word. Okay. And it is the root word of restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Okay. So they're related. Now, <clears throat> Esther chapter 8 This is where we're going to look at the exact same word, but in a positive sense. This is the exact same word from Psalm 51. Oop, I didn't get to Esther. I ended up in Deuteronomy, sorry. Okay. Now then, this is when uh, Haman was trying to kill Mordecai, but then his plan was revealed, and Haman himself is killed, and Mordecai is set free. And in Esther 8.16, We read, for the Jews there was light and gladness and joy and honor. The word joy is restore to me the joy of thy salvation, the exact same word. Verse 17, in each and every province and in each and every city, wherever the king's commandment and his decree arrived, there was gladness and joy for the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many of the peoples of the land became Jews, for the dread of the Jews had fallen on them. So there is a connection between the people being glad in the Lord, restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and the fear of the Lord falling on the people in uh in the country where Haman and Esther lived. That's interesting to me. <clears throat> the people had joy and the fear of God fell on them. Now this is the fear of the, the God, fear of the Lord, P-A-C-H-A-D. This is the word for the fear of God that is a name of God. It's the kind of fear that God put on Canaan so Israel could conquer them. And it's the kind of the fear of the Lord that is associated with God's right arm or the power of his 
mighty arm. Okay, so the joy of, my, of thy salvation and this P-A-C-H-A-D, fear of God, go together. And we're going to see this again in Isaiah chapter 12. What was that, that other reference there that you had just read? Uh, Esther 8, 16 and 17. Okay. And now Isaiah 12. A one through three. Verse two and three is the main ones we're going to be looking at. But to continue the thought, we're going to read to verse six also. Isaiah 12, one through three, but read to verse six. Then you will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. So we see forgiveness going on here. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. And that's the P-A-C-H-A-D. For the Lord God is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. And in that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, <coughs> make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song, for he has done excellent things. Let this be known throughout the earth. Cry aloud and shout for joy, O inhabitants of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. So we see forgiveness. We see the people having joy, the same joy that David's talking about. And we see, the same as in Esther, uh, this same kind of fear of God is, is made mention. Now, These words that in Isaiah chapter 12, this is what Kyle and Delish say. These words are to be understood as, as, I'm sorry, these words are to be understood as expressing a desire that the glorious self-attestation of the God of salvation might be brought to the consciousness or conscious attention of all the inhabitants of the earth. When God redeems his people, he has the salvation of all the nations in view or on his mind. <clears throat> Psalm 51, David talks about joy of salvation willing or free spirit, and teaching transgressors God's ways. Esther, we see that happen. Isaiah, we, we see it taught also. That God was angry with them. His anger turned away because they confessed and repented. And then they joyously draw water from the springs of sex of salvation, and throughout the earth, they begin to hear about God. See that same pattern repeated over and over and over again. It's part of what happens when people repent. And it is the knowledge of the Holy One made known through the Word of God and, pro and the proclamation of the word of God that brings salvation to them, all the ends of the earth. Okay? Now then, verse 3 of this Isaiah talks about springs of salvation 
It also could be, the same word could be translated well of salvation or fountain of salvation. And our, what we need to see here is just as God miraculously supplied Israel with water in the desert, so will God open up wells or springs, fountains of salvation. And we will see salvation running like a flood. Now then, at this moment, this is where, for me, everything got really complicated. Because uh, everything from here on out, it's all interwoven with all interwoven, and it's hard to separate out the piece, the parts. We've got joy of salvation, and we have being sustained with a willing or free or noble spirit. Okay, so this Isaiah 12, 3 is talking about the, the water that God supplied in the desert. For a time, God supplied the water from the rock, but then later, God commanded the nobles to dig a well. The ones who had the willing or free spirit were the ones who dug the well. Now, this, these wells appear in many different places in the Old Testament. Martin Lloyd-Jones preaches a, a series of 20 sermons that are based upon a few verses in Genesis where it says, Isaac dug again the wells of his father Abraham, for the Philistines had stopped them up. Because of the work of the Philistines, they stopped up the wells so that they didn't produce water anymore. Later on, we're going to see that the, cho that the false ones have stolen the chosen. In other words, they've stopped up the wells, and we no longer see this, this wealth of salvation coming forth. And God picks the free, those in free, of a free spirit or a willing spirit, <clears throat> which is also translated noble, to be the ones that either dig the wells or unstop them. So this, where he says willing spirit is synonyms with those who have a wise heart. A wise heart or a willing heart is the same word. The opposite of a wise and willing heart and a noble heart is called a fool or a rogue, R-O-G-U-E, or a churl, C-H-U-R-L, in the King James. Fool, rogue, or churl. In Hebrew, the opposite of a rogue or churl is, a man of, is the root of sagacity. You see how that's sort of complicated? This willing spirit is the same as a wise heart or a willing heart, is the same as the root of sagacity. And so God uses those men that are those people who have those characteristics to unstop what the Philistines have, have, have stopped. So we have to sort of keep that in our mind as we go through here. But the picture from Isaiah 12 
is the springs of salvation or wells of salvation is where God's describing a vast supply of, of salvation. Think about salvation running like a flood. Have you seen the pictures of, of, of the flood caused by the hurricane? You know, the water's up some places to the eaves of the house. Picture salvation running like, like that as a flood through society. That's the idea. Now, the, when we're thinking about these wells of water, salvation or fountains of salvation, of course, we think about Proverbs 14, 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. But John 4.14 tells us that God puts this fountain of life in our hearts. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the salvation like a flood in our hearts, once we get right with God, once God has restored to us the joy of his salvation and sustained us with a, a willing, free, or noble spirit. Of course, the opposite of this is Psalm 36. And this, Psalm 36, shows the picture of this, shows this picture very clearly. Thirty-six one. Transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. There is no fear. This is the P-A-C-H-A-D of God before his eyes. When there, the one who has no fear is the ungodly. He's the rogue. He's the churlish. But when that person repents, then God restores that. And then he, he goes along and describes all of what happens because of sin. And then starting in verse 5, the loving kindness of God that's on those who fear him. And in verse 9, For with you is the fountain of light. In your light, we see light. This fear of God that's a fountain of life starts with God. He puts it in our hearts. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We talked about this a little bit last week. Okay. Is it making any sense yet? Seeing how these things are connected? Proverbs 10 and verse 11. The mouth of, of righteous is a fountain of life. God puts it in our heart. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. And then Proverbs 13, 14, the teaching of the wise is a fountain of life. And then Proverbs 16, 22, Proverbs 16, I'm going to use the Hebrew word. Sagacity is a fountain of life to the one who has it. But the discipline of fools is folly. See, so God is describing the person 
who has repented. And one of the ways we know they've repented, the joy of salvation is returned and God sustains them with a willing, free, noble spirit. Okay? Sagacity is a fountain of life to the one who has it. Now, let's go back to Isaiah 33, 6. We've looked at this a long, long time ago, but we haven't looked at it from this perspective. But we're going to see how these things all connect. Isaiah 33, 6. We're going to read verse 5 and 6. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. And he will be the stability of your time. A wealth, in Hebrew it's the word chosen, C-H-O-C-E-N. A wealth of salvation wisdom, and knowledge, the fear of the Lord is his treasure. So here again, we're seeing the same picture that we've already looked at, but God's describing it in, another, in other ways. He will be the stability of your times, a wealth of salvation. A wealth of salvation speaks about salvation running like a flood. It speaks about a rich storehouse, a plentiful supply, a super abundance. When I first started pastoring back in 1973, our little church on a good day might have 20. We eventually grew up in the 40s. But uh, one year we saw 12 people come to Christ out of that tiny little church. Now that is not the wealth of salvation that was seen back in the 50s and 60s. But it is a wealth of salvation compared to what we see today. That God's plan, when God's people are right with him, God is the stability of our times, and he is a wealth of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge, and the fear of the Lord is his treasure. Now, this word chosen in Hebrew, the word that's translated treasure, has three ideas that are connected to it. Number one is salvation, number two is wisdom, and number three is knowledge. Chosen is also directly connected and related to the seven gifts implied in salvation. This is Isaiah 11, one through three. But chosen places particular emphasis on the seventh gift, and the seventh gift is delighting in or being of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. Okay, so this word treasure chosen is directly related to the seven gifts implied in salvation. That's Isaiah 11, 1 through 3, but particularly related to the seventh gift, delighting in or being of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And prophet Isaiah calls this the treasure of God's people. It 
It's our treasure. Okay. Now let's look in the negative sense. Ezekiel 22 and verse 25. This is speaking about the false ones, the false prophets, preachers, and teachers. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst, like a roaring lion, till a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured lives. They have taken the chosen, the treasure, and precious things. They have made many widows in the midst of her. So we, we know they're false because they're stealing what God gives. But we also know they're false because of Psalm 36 tells us there is no fear of God before their eyes. And they are stealing the treasure. They are stealing this wealth of salvation. They're stealing the uh, seven implied gifts that are implied with salvation. The answer to this, of course, is for these men to come to the same kind of repentance that David had. Then God restores to them the joy of their salvation, which is speaking about the, well, let's go back. When the, if, if these false ones would repent, God would create in them a clean heart. He would renew a steadfast spirit. He would restore the joy of his salvation. He would sustain them with a willing, free, or noble spirit. And they would again to teach transgressions your ways. And like we saw last week, that, it, that is primarily the fear of God. Okay, we're living in a time when the false ones have stolen the treasure. There's no way we can deny that. It's, it's, it's right there in front of our eyes. Okay, so false ones can steal the treasure. All right, it's not very pretty, but we have to look at it. Isaiah 63. And let's start with verse 17, just so we get it in our mind. And then we'll back up and get some of the context. Why, O oh Lord, do you cause us to stray from your ways and harden our heart from fearing you? Now, the word fear there is the Y-I-R-A-H. It's the kind of the fear of God that's most closely associated with salvation. It's the chosen that the false ones have stolen. But in this case, it's God that's hardened their hearts so that his people will not fear him. Hmm. Okay. This is one of the remedial judgments of God. Remedial judgments of God are, are supposed to be clear. So when we see it happen, we recognize, oh, this is God's remedial judgment. This means we need to repent and return to God. But in, in this particular case, uh,
forget I said, but in this particular case. Isaiah 63, even though it has this really difficult line in it, verse 17, it speaks about Israel and how they sinned and then returned and then they sin and then they return and, it, and then they sin. But in the end, as you get down into verse chapter 64, it talks about them returning to God again. But if we find ourselves living in a time like today when people are strayed so far from God's ways and our hearts are hardened from fearing God, that's telling us this is a time for repentance. A hard heart would be the opposite of a free or willing heart. There's no fear of God before their eyes because their eyes have become, their vision is damaged. They can no longer see clearly. David, the prophet said, you detested or despised God's word and you despised God himself. In doing so, his heart turned away he turned away from God, he turned away from God's ways, and he was hardening his own heart so that he did not fear God. But in repentance, he prays, restore to me the joy of your salvation. David wants to see salvation run like a flood in his own life and then also in the world, okay? Then he says, sustain me with a willing or noble free spirit. And we've already talked about noble is a willing heart. It's a wise heart. It's a heart that has the root of sagacity. The opposite of noble, is Nabal in, in Hebrew, N-A-B-A-L. Remember before David, he had already been anointed king, but he hadn't, Saul was still alive. There was a man named Nabal and his wife was named uh, Abigail. Abigail. Oh yeah, and he was bad guy. He was a really bad guy. Well, his name was Nabal, which is the Hebrew word for the opposite of, for a person who's the opposite of a noble, willing, wise, root of sagacity person. So his parents doomed him or that was his nickname. Right. And so David wants to be the opposite of that. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple of verses about, to show you from the Bible about those who have this willing heart, free, free heart, or noble heart. Numbers 21. Although I had read this many times, I never till today put this together. <laughs> Numbers 21. Starting in verse 6. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many of the people of Israel died. So they're sinning. And then they repent.
then starting about in verse 16, come down. But the word, the verse that we're going to put our attention to is verse 18. The well which the leaders sank, which the nobles of the people dug with the scepter and with their staff. The word there that says, which the nobles dug is the exact same word that's used in Psalm 51. When David says, I'm sorry, I was on the wrong page again. Sustain me with a willing spirit or a free spirit or a, no, or a noble spirit. These men who had this free, willing, noble spirit are the men that did the work when God asked them to do. So let's start in verse 16. They could, from there they continued to beer. That is, well, the, that is the well where the Lord said to Moses, assemble the people that I may give them water. Then Israel sang this song. Spring up, O well, sing to it. The well which the leaders sank, which the nobles of the people dug, with the scepter and with their staff, and from the wilderness they continued on. Okay, Kyle and Delish tell us, up until this point, God provided the people water from the rock. But starting here, God provided people from the well. He provided the people water from the well, which those of a willing, free, and noble spirit dug. These men of sagacity who took the lead, the ones who knew the fountain of living water in their heart, and it poured from their mouth, it was also visible in their actions. Okay? Go back to, to Genesis 26, 18. Uh, Charlie, did you ever get to listen to those 20 sermons on revival from Martin Lloyd-Jones? Yeah, I haven't heard all of them. I have heard a few. Yes. I. Uh, it's taken from Genesis 26, 18. Then Isaac, of course, Isaac was a man who feared the Lord. Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham, for the Philistines had stopped them up. The Philistines stopping them up, of course, Philistines refers to the world. The world stopping up the wells of salvation. And then we have the, the false prophets, preachers, and teachers who also stop them up and steal them. But the answer is God's men, God's people repenting and being restored and returning to these old ways, these ancient ways. You see how they're all, it's all in, interconnected? Now then, <clears throat> Exodus 35, 5. And I had never seen this yes. till I started studying this. So in Exodus 35, uh, Moses is commanding the people, these are the things that God's told you to do. Now, don't work on the Sabbath. But then in verse 5, take from among you a contribution to the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart. 
let him bring it as the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, bronze, and so on. This is speaking about these offerings to provide the materials to build the ark, the tabernacle. I'm sorry, to build the tabernacle. Those who have a willing heart or a free heart, noble heart, it's all the same word, are the ones who are making this contribution to the Lord. This is not a tithe. This is above and beyond the tithe. Now, we could try to imagine how much money the church would have if every member tithes. I once read a calculation, this was done in the late 1980s, that if every person in the world who claimed to be a Christian tithed, there would be so much money that every hungry person in the world could be fed as well as take care of the operating budgets of all the churches. True or not, I don't know. But if we're thinking about a wealth of salvation, a flood of salvation, what would it look like when God's people gave from a willing heart? That's what he's talking about. Then, in verse 10, in New American Standard, it says, Let every skillful man among you come and make what the Lord commanded. Actually, in Hebrew, it says, Those who have a wise heart. And so there's, there's many scriptures that we could look at tonight where it shows that a, wise, a willing heart and a wise heart is the same heart. But for the sake of time, we, we're, we're, we're going to move forward. And let's go back to Deuteronomy 4. We're going to see here What happens when God's people do what God has asked? Okay. And I wrote the verse down wrong. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Okay, I'm sorry I wrote it down. I'm in six. No wonder I six and seven. I was looking at Deuteronomy six. No wonder I couldn't find it. Deuteronomy four. And verse six. But verse five will read through the context. See, I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So keep them and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to, to it as the Lord God, whenever we call on him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law, which I am setting before you today? Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, so you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen, 
and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Assemble the people to me, that I may let them hear my words, so they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, and they may teach their children. So God tells us that one of the things that is a great witness and testimony to the, to the lost people of the world is when they see that God's people are a wise and understanding people. Okay. Wise and understanding people. Okay. And we get to be wise and understanding people like David here in Psalm 51 when we repent and God restores the joy of his salvation and puts back into us this willing heart. First Chronicles 12, 32. We've looked at this before, but I want us to look in at it from this perspective of what happens to a man's heart or a person's heart when they have repented and God has restored the joy of his salvation and they continue walking in it. Now, I'd never thought of this either. First Chronicles chapter 12, uh, when we start with verse 23 and come down, He's giving account of all the people who turned out to come to David because they wanted him to be the king. And so he's talking about 6,800 from Judah, 7,100 from Simeon, 4,600 from Levi, 3,700 from Jehoiada, Benjamin, 3,000, Ephraim, 20,800, the poor little half-tribe of Manasseh, 18,000 turned out, Zebulun, 50,000, Danites, 28,600, Asher, 40,000. But then let's look at verse 32 compared to thousands of the sons of Ishakar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do, their chiefs were 200. What's 200 compared to 50,000 or 20,000 or 7,000? Very few. Very few. But they are set apart from the rest of them because these were men who understood the times and they had knowledge of what to do. They were men who feared God, men who had grown in the fear of God to where they not only had the root of sagacity, they had sagacity themselves. Okay. Now then, I'm, we're going to compare those guys with the book of Esther. Let's see, here we go. Esther chapter one. And verse 13. Esther chapter 1 and verse 13. 
Now, the king in the book of Esther, the Bible tells them, tells us that this king had wise men. Notice how it describes them. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for it was the custom of the king, so to speak, before all who knew law and justice and were close to him. So he's asking their advice. These are also men who understood the times. They were wise men. But they were wise men who were wise in astrology. They were wise in the knowledge of the Magi, but they were not wise in the fear of God. So their understanding of the times was very, very different from men who understood the times with knowledge of what to do based upon the fear of God. The men that were giving advice to the king in the book of Esther had the best of the world's knowledge. Okay. So we have to be a little careful in uh, what kind of wise men we're looking for. Because it can be the difference between life and death. Jesus talked about this also. And I wrote it down wrong. Again, but... It was when Jesus was saying that they, they could understand the weather, right. they could predict the weather, but they didn't understand the times in which they were living. It was part of being the woes. Okay, and then 1 Kings 3.9, was in 2nd Kings. I need 1st Kings. 1st Kings 3, 9. This is Solomon's prayer. <clears throat> you know, I was always taught to, that <clears throat> Solomon asked for wisdom. Well, he did but not exactly. So chapter 3 of 1 Kings, Solomon is praying and he says, so give your servant an understanding heart. Really what, what he prays in Hebrew is, give your servant a hearing heart to judge your people to discern or distinguish between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? And then of course we know that, that God answered, answered this prayer. So a wise heart, a free heart, a noble heart, and a hearing heart are all the same. And this is what David is asking for in Psalm 51. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. We want to see these wells of living water that have been stopped up by sin 
and stopped up by the Philistines flooding out again and sustain me with a willing, free, or noble spirit. A spirit that has the root of sagacity as its dominating character. All right. That's what David is asking in, in praying in Psalm 51, 12. We don't have it. It's very rare to find it. But that is what God wants. All right, so did I thoroughly confuse you? <laughs> no, to um, begin to connect all of those things. I, I assume a, a clean heart and a, a steadfast spirit or right spirit, ready spirit, these are all kind of expressing, explaining the same thing. Yes. And so going through um, the willing heart, the the wise heart, the hearing heart, the noble heart. These, these just kind of expand for us what, what repentance, true repentance looks like when God gives it. Yes. And that's one of the fruits and they're all related to the, to the fear of God. Yeah. And then in the new Testament, of course, in Romans, when he speaks about the, the unchanging repentance for the sake of God, right? what fear is mentioned as one of those fruits of repentance. And it's referring yeah. to all these things that we've been talking about. Yeah. The, um, the importance of definitions and the uh, kind of the battle for definitions. Yes. Oh, I didn't realize it was hanging off the screen. All right. um, kind of hit home for us a little bit more as we were reading the Proverbs over the last week. Yeah. Just because our understanding of wisdom is is kind of a world has been a worldly understanding of wisdom. Right. And so when we read. Proverbs. There's so many. There's so many words. You know, wisdom, understanding, uh, knowledge. That we had kind of filled in the blanks with uh, with a worldly understanding of what those wisdoms look like. You know. Yes. Um, I I think that's why. So often preachers can uh, can abuse the verses in Proverbs because the understanding that we have for the the words is different to what Solomon and the other authors of Proverbs were meaning by them. You know, yes. so you know your prosperity preacher talks about wisdom and. Uh, and he and, and a lot of the people that are listening to him may well be thinking in terms of wisdom to run a business well, make good transactions and make a lot of money, not realizing that the wisdom is talking about uh, the wisdom that begins with the fear of the Lord, yeah. which is a fruit of, of regeneration. And it's one of those gifts implied with salvation that wisdom from Isaiah 11. So, so when we read through it again, I think probably the first time since, um, at least the first time recently, and all of these words have been enriched in their meaning for us. Yes. Um, 
and related to the fear of the Lord, it's helped immensely to to understand what the proverb is is saying and uh, and give us you know God's definition of wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all of those words that are used in the book of Proverbs. So um, I think this would this would be similar to that in in Psalm fifty one as we understand what a clean heart means and uh, a right spirit, um, the joy of our salvation and that, and that, um, uh, let me look it up, which verse, but see, seeing all of these things in light, yeah, his, his free spirit. Yes, noble, it's free willing. Noble, free spirit. Um, Be, just being able to <clears throat> see these things in light of the fear of the Lord again, right, kind of helps the understanding greatly. Well, it was very helpful for me when I finally figured it out that this willing, free, noble spirit mm -hmm. is the, the the heart that has sagacity. Right. So that was very helpful for me. And the root word of sagacity is S-A-K-E-L -E 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 and then S-E-K-E-L. -E -E Which is translated understanding in Isaiah 11, 1 through 3? Uh, in Isaiah 11, 1 through 3, the word, that word doesn't appear. Okay. The root word of sagacity implies that you have all seven and that you have grown in them. You've learned how to use them in a practical sense. Right. And That's then right. sagacity, of course, is the goal. Right. Okay. So let's go back to what you were saying about how we define words. And the, 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 the way that most people in the church define wisdom and knowledge. So... I look at every week 40 to 50, uh, I don't like to use the word, but that's what they are, advertisements, where churches are advertising for a pastor. Right. They all want someone that has very high education, masters or doctorate. Because to them, that says wisdom and knowledge. I've yet to see one that says, we're looking for a man who fits the qualification of, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Right. Although there was a time in American history, in the history of American churches, that that was one of the most important requirements when they were looking for a pastor. Right. But because our, our understanding of the definition of wisdom and knowledge has changed, it, it affects us in a practical sense in the way that we do things. Right. Okay. All right. Any other questions? I was just thinking that is something I brought up to Gerald on Sunday. Um, but some Christians or organizations, even churches that... Uh, the specific case was answers in Genesis, but I've seen this in more places, the need to use adjectives like this award-winning publication or uh, Harvard, class. yeah, our world-class facilities, our Harvard trained, our, and I, I had, I was reading a, kind of an article, the history of answers in Genesis, like these adjectives over and over again, and I've seen other places, but it, that need to have to qualify. Right. Um, Excellent from a worldly perspective, as if it shows hey, we're the we're legit, we're the real thing. And I'm talking about even even false teachers. You know, they've got they've got the glossy, high quality. Um, it's not that it's not that high quality that would impress people in the world that makes it better. In fact, the world would tend to scoff, regardless of how nice quality their facilities are. There, but just that 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 compulsion to use that language when it's like 
or just say this is what we do to, we want to do it to the glory of god and leave it at that and if people show up and see it's high class well yay but then emphasizing that to have people support you or to have credibility and we saw tonight um, I think it was in Deuteronomy where it was supposed to be our wisdom that makes the people uh, of the world attracted. But you're right. The the it's uh, Deuteronomy four six. Yes, I don't. Know. I wrote it down somewhere, but right this instant I can't find where I wrote it down. But it is it is Deuteronomy four six. So keep them and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. That's what would be attractive to them. But we've lost, we've lost the fear of God, so we have to make a substitute. So you are exactly correct. Okay. So what is what we're, what we're taking from that verse is that for us to fear the Lord and keep His commandments, that's you know if we are to be outstanding in anybody's eyes, it should be for that fact. Right. Right. In fact, the Bible says God blesses us that the ends of the earth will fear him. Now, in the, in the end of the 1990s or the early part of the 2000s, I don't know exactly when it was, but I was at a missionary conference. And it said American missionaries have some success when they're going to really poor places because these poor people are attracted to come and listen because the Americans have so much more money than they do. But when the American missionaries have extremely, no, extremely little success or no success, when they try to go to places that are uh, middle class, upper middle class and above, because they have nothing, the American missionaries have nothing that is attractive to those people. And that shows a lack of the fear of God because God said they will be attracted by your wisdom and understanding. All features that come from the fear of God. Okay. Anything else? So in in Deuteronomy twenty eight sixty three. Okay, Deuteronomy twenty eight sixty three. Where the where God delights over you to prosper you. As he delighted over you to do you good, so he will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. The exact same word. Uh, it's the word for joy, yes. Wow. Just, I mean, in terms of the, the theology that that reveals um, well I think it says something about how God hates sin sure does yeah. yeah you know I had a man tell me you know in Revelation when it talks about the, the 
this, the one who comes conquering and destroying and the blood is as high as the bridles bit. Yep. The, the revelation said that's Christ on the horse. And he said he can't imagine that being Christ. No, based on how we've constructed Christ to be, it's not imaginable. <laughs> right. And that's why that word self-attestation uh, is, is such a powerful word. It's a word that we've lost in theological terms, but it's such a powerful word in, in proclaiming God's word and helping people to come to an understanding of who God is. Just to, you know, even, even when we, even when we talk about the justice and the severity of God, I think we still have in our minds some, you know, some idea of, of God being forced against his will to do justice like that, you know? Okay. <laughs> well, not uh, just, just in terms of... I understand what you're saying. We apologize for God in such a way that if we say he is going to destroy the wicked then we we have to we we we're in danger of feeling some need to say that he doesn't want to do that but um that, that verse hadn't stuck out to me like that before for some reason yeah well but you know god really does hate sin yeah he really really does The, in fact, this the end of last week, I found an audio cassette of the very first sermon I ever heard Brother Roberts preach. Huh? And the whole sermon was a self-attestation. He would read a passage and say, is this your God? Yeah. Because this is the God of the Bible. And one of those, the passages that he read is, why have you hardened our hearts that we no longer fear you? Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to turn the recording off.